promises of God my Savior standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with a spirit sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God. Please be seated. Tonight, Lord willing, we want to continue our study of Elijah, the prophet who stopped the rain and stilled the people. We talked about in the morning lesson that there are three traits for which Elijah is best known. He is known for passion, he is known for power, and he is known for prayer. We covered the matter of passion in the morning lesson, pointing out that Elijah was a man just like us. He had the same feelings and infirmities that we do. He was tempted in the same ways like as we are. He was just a man. But tonight we want to continue our study of him, and we want to tonight consider the power of Elijah. Few have ever walked upon this earth with more power than what this man did. And when the Bible talks about Elijah, the Bible talks about him in terms of his power. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, as we are introduced to John the Baptist in his great work, we are told that John had been prophesied. In fact, the Old Testament ends with a prophecy of John the Baptist. In Malachi chapter 4, in verses 5 and 6, we read of an Elijah who is to come. There was an Elijah in the Old Testament, but there was also an Elijah in the New Testament. And the Elijah in the New Testament was John the Baptist. He was a man of great power. He was one who came in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. He was a man who came to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. He came to turn the disobedient back to the wisdom of the just. And he did it in a very powerful way. In the New Testament, when we study the life of John the Baptist, we are seeing Elijah in the New Testament. We are seeing the kind of man that existed hundreds of years before that. The kind of man that was sent to, to lead Israel to repentance. In the New Testament, John the Baptist was sent to lead his own nation to repentance. There's a great number of similarities between these men, but there is no similarity greater than the similarity of power. And we talked about in the morning lesson that Elijah was known as the Tishbite, which refers to the fact that he was born in a little town called Tishbe in the land of Gilead. We don't know a great deal about that land other than it was rustic and remote, but we do know that this term Tishbite sometimes is translated as converter. And the idea is that he came from the land of conversion. And he is going to be a converter. He is going to spend his life turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children. He's going to spend his life trying to get a nation that is disobedient to be obedient again. And he's going to do it with all the power that he possibly can. It is interesting to me that in the New Testament, when James brings up Elijah in James chapter 5, when he says Elias was a man, subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. When, I, when James goes into that discussion of, of Elijah, he closes out that chapter with talking about conversion. He said, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. And I'd never really had considered the, 
the implications of that passage following that discussion of Elijah. But if it is the case, and it seems to be, that Elijah in the Old Testament was one who converted Israel, one who brought Israel back, then it's natural for James, when James talks about Elijah, to again bring up this matter of conversion and turning people back. In 1 Kings chapter 18, on the Mount Carmel, when they are there debating, uh, having this contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah, Elijah is going to win that contest. But as Elijah is preparing to make his offering, the text tells us that the altar of the Lord had been broken down. It had been broken down through neglect. Perhaps it had even been broken down by the people who followed Baal, who were trying to remove God completely from the land. Well, whatever the case, the altar of the Lord had been broken down. And so Elijah is going to rebuild that altar. And it's interesting that in 1 Kings 18, we're told that he takes 12 stones with which he will rebuild that altar. The 12 stones is very, very significant. Now, you can understand at least some of the significance of that number. We know that there were 12 tribes in Israel. And no doubt each stone represented one of those 12 tribes. But if you know anything about Israel's history at this point, then you know that Israel was divided. You know that there were ten of the north, there were two of the south. You remember the split that took place because of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And and that split had occurred and had been going now for about 60 years. But when Elijah rebuilds this this altar, he goes back beyond that division. He goes back to when Israel was one, the way Israel was supposed to be, And he builds an altar that represents that. He goes back beyond the religious division. Now here's the point. It's a point you ought to get. It's a point that you ought to make note of in your mind. If we want to rebuild things today, what do we have to do? We have to go back to a time when things were one. We have to go back beyond the division and the denominationalism of our day. And we have to go back and rebuild what our Lord built Initially, We have to go back to that point. It does us no good to, to kind of make some order out of what is left. No, we have to go back beyond the division. We have to get back to when things were one. That's what we're trying to restore. That's what we're trying to be. As we think about this altar and it being broken down, I want you to understand that the national altar had been broken down. Ahab and Jezebel had introduced Baal worship to Israel. They had made Baal worship the state religion. But not only had the national altar whereby men would approach God been broken down, but the family altar had been broken down. These families were no longer teaching their children about Jehovah God. Now their children were learning about Baal. And so God sent Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. He sent Elijah to rebuild not only the national altar, but to rebuild these family altars. Brethren, in our land today, the national altar has been broken down. Our nation as a whole does not honor, does not respect, does not serve God as she once did. But I want you to understand that there are far more altars than that altar that's been broken down. It really goes to the point to where the family altar has been broken down. How many children are growing up in homes today where they're not being taught anything about God, anything about God's Word? where they are not being given any spiritual instruction. We need to rebuild those altars. We need to get back to doing that. And when we do, then our nation will get back to being what it needs to be as well. We need to rebuild the home. Elijah is going to be a part of that. John the Baptist, of course, is going to be a part of that. Now, I want you to understand that when you read about Elijah and when you read about John the Baptist, you're reading about men who stood with power. Matthew chapter 11, in verses 7 through 9, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist who came in the Spirit and the power of Elijah. When Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, He asked the people, what went you out for to see? What did you go out to see? You remember, John was preaching the Word. He wasn't preaching in the town, and so they had to go out to see Him. They had to go out to hear Him, and Jesus wants to know, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a reed shaking with the wind? If you did, that's not what you found. That's not what you saw. Because John was not a reed shaking with the wind. 
John was a mighty oak tree that had his roots deep in the earth. John wasn't one you can blow about. John wasn't one that you can move easily. John was one who would take a stand. And Elijah in the Old Testament was the same way. Elijah in the Old Testament was not a reed shaken with a wind. He was one that would stand in Ahab's face and declare that Ahab was the problem in Israel. He was a man who would take a stand. We need men like that today. Remember that Jesus went ahead to say, He said, did you go out to see someone in soft raiment? Well, if you did, that's not what you found, because that wasn't the way John the Baptist dressed. No, John the Baptist wore a leather girdle. He wore camel skin. Have you ever touched a camel? Ever been to the zoo and had the opportunity to reach out and pet a camel? I've done that. You know how a camel feels? Is it soft? Like maybe the fur of some mink or something like that? No, 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 it's not soft like that. It's very rough. There's just a patch of hair here and a patch of hair there. It's not even pretty, but it's rough. That's the kind of garment that he wore. That's the kind of clothing that, that Elijah wore as well. You can go back to 2 Kings chapter 1, and there's going to be a king who doesn't even see him, but can tell by his dress it had to be Elijah. That was the garment that prophets wore. They wore hairy garments, the skin of an animal. And usually they wore some type of, of girdle or belt to hold that all together. That was the case with both of these. They weren't wearing soft garments. In fact, Jesus said, those that wear soft raiment they dwell in king's houses. But you're not going to find John the Baptist in the king's house. No, you'll find him out in the wilderness. Where are you going to find Elijah? You're going to find him out by the brook Carrot. You're going to find him somewhere out in the wilderness. You're not going to find him in a, a soft place of ease or comfort. Jesus said as well, did you go out to see a prophet? If you did, you saw a prophet, yea, more than a prophet. You saw a prophet's prophet if you went out to see John the Baptist. Sometimes we talk about people and we say they are a preacher's preacher. And what do we mean by that? We, we mean that they excel in the art of preaching. We mean that if preachers could pick a preacher, that's who they would pick. That's who they would want to be. Brother Wendell Winkler was a preacher's preacher. He's a preacher that preachers wanted to be. Andrew Connolly was a preacher's preacher. He was a preacher that preachers wanted to be. They were those kind of men. Elijah and John the Baptist, they were a prophet's prophet. They were the kind of man that a prophet would have been looking for because they excelled in that. They were men who were strong. In Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, God says on one occasion, I sought for a man that would stand in the gap, that would make up the hedge... Then God says these words, But I found none. God says, I was looking for someone who would take a stand, but God said, I couldn't find anyone. But if we were to take that statement and move it from Ezekiel's day back into Ahab's day, this is the way it would read, But I found one. God found one who would do that. Now there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, but there is one man who will stand up for God. There is one man who will be bold. There is one man that will go and stand in Ahab's face and tell Ahab what God says. And that's Elijah. Today God's looking for men. Does he find none? Does he find one? Is there anyone out there who will stand up for what is right? Anyone that will stand in the power and in the spirit of Elijah? Now, when John the Baptist preached, it reminds you of when Elijah preached. You know, John didn't hold anything back when he preached. In Matthew chapter 3, John's preaching, beginning in verse 7 down through that context, and as he's addressing that audience, he says, O generation of vipers. Now, what if I got up this morning and called you a generation of vipers? Do you like that? You'd say that was strong preaching, right? It was strong preaching. That's what John preached. He went ahead to say that you say you're Abraham's children, but I'm telling you that God can take these stones right here and raise up children. I'm here to tell you that God's laid the axe at the root of the tree. God's going to cut you down as a nation. 
If you don't turn, if you don't change, if you don't get yourself straightened out, God's going to cut you down. That's the kind of preaching that John did. And it didn't matter if John was standing before a king, he preached that same way. He went in before Herod, and he said, it is not lawful for thee to have her. Matthew 14 in verse 4. It didn't matter, that's the way he preached. You think about the way that Elijah preached. Elijah preached with great power. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, he stood there on Mount Carmel, he stood there before all the people that had gathered, he said, how long halt ye between two opinions? How long is it going to be before you make up, a, make up your minds, Elijah says? When are you going to make a decision? If God is God, then you serve Him. If Baal is God, then you serve Him. But you've got to make a decision. And Elijah was calling for that decision to be made right then and right there. That's the way Elijah preached. Brother Wendell Winkler used to say of preaching and of the preacher that is what he needs to be, that he shells the corn and he shows the cob. That's really what preaching is. Preaching is really getting right down to business. It's getting right down to where people live. It's getting right down to the sins that are in people's lives and dealing with them. It isn't a flowery discourse, but it's dealing with sin. And Elijah did that, John did that, we're supposed to do that as well. They were men who would take a stand. Someone said of them that they were one-fourth backbone and three-fourths gristle. I think that's true. The kind of men that they were. They were men that could not be blown about or moved about. They were men who were strong. I want you to understand something. In Elijah's day, soft preaching wouldn't have worked. It just wouldn't have worked. The people were hard-hearted. For 60 years or so, there had been unbelief, there had been immorality, there had been assassination after assassination as one king replaced another king. There was lawlessness. And the people's hearts were hardened. Think about how hard their hearts had to be in order for it to take three and a half years of drought to get them to the point at which they could be converted. They were hard-hearted and soft preaching would not have worked. They were ignorant of God and His will. In 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 34, we read about a man by the name of Hal. He was a Bethelite. Hal tried to rebuild Jericho. Now, if Hal had known anything about the Scriptures, he would not have tried to rebuild Jericho. Because when Jericho was destroyed back in Joshua's day, God cursed it. And God pronounced a curse that said, if you try to rebuild this city, you're going to lose your sons. But here's Hal in Ahab's day, who's living in the darkness of Baal, Hal says, I'm going to rebuild Jericho. He lays the foundation, he loses his oldest son. Then when he tries to set up the gates, he loses another son. Ignorance. Ignorance. All that could have been avoided. All that could have been prevented. All you had to do was know something about God's Word. But they didn't. Elijah was dealing with people that were ignorant. He was dealing with people that were immoral. He was dealing with people that were hard-hearted. And it took strong preaching to get through to them. It takes strong preaching to get through to people today as well. When Elijah stood before kings, like John the Baptist, he delivered the same message to kings that he delivered to others. He didn't soften the message. He didn't guard what he had to say. No, kings needed the message just as much as everyone else did. Think about some of the times where he stood before Ahab. In 1 Kings chapter 18... In verses 17 and 18, the time comes where God has told Elijah to go and show himself to Ahab. Now, in 1 Kings 17, God says, go hide yourself. But in 1 Kings 18, he says, go show yourself. Now, most of us have no problem whatsoever hiding ourselves. We could have followed that command without any difficulty. But when God says, I want you to go show yourself to Ahab, that would have been hard to follow. But Elijah will follow that. Elijah will go to meet Ahab. He will meet Obadiah first. Obadiah uh, is given a message. You go tell Ahab, Elijah is here. 
And Obadiah doesn't want to go and give that message. Because Obadiah knows that if he goes back to Ahab and he says, I have found Elijah, and they come to find Elijah, and Elijah's not there, Obadiah's dead. Obadiah says, don't make me go deliver that message. He begins to explain to Elijah, my Lord Ahab has looked for you in every kingdom in the earth. In fact, he's made these kingdoms take an oath that they don't know where you are. My Lord wants you more than anyone's ever wanted anyone. You're a wanted man. Elijah knew that. But he appears before Ahab. And Ahab says this, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? you imagine that? Ahab says to Elijah, you're the one that's caused all of this trouble. You're the problem. Now, it is true, at least to some degree, that Elijah had caused this problem. After all, it was Elijah that had prayed that it might not rain, and it had not rained for three years and six months. And so there is a ground at which Elijah is to blame for this. But why did Elijah pray that it might not rain? Because Ahab and Jezebel had introduced Baal worship to Israel, and the people had gone after it, lock, stock, and barrel. And Elijah said, we've got to get these people to turn around. We've got to convert them, and the only way we're going to convert them is by trying to get them to see that Baal is not in charge, but rather that Jehovah is in charge. And so Elijah said, God, don't let it rain until they fall on their knees and they acknowledge that you are the giver of the rain and of everything else. I want to make a point. I want you to get the point. We are living in tough economic times. We're living in tough economic times because men have forgotten about God. And there are those of us who for some time have been praying that our leaders would acknowledge their mistakes. That our leaders would again pursue a course of righteousness. That our leaders would again pursue a course of life and morality. And we've been praying for that to happen. In essence, we have been praying that it will not rain until America comes to her knees. It's interesting to me that in 1 Kings 17, Elijah goes, he is dwelling by the brook Kareth, and he is drinking of that wonderful water. But the day came when that brook dried up. And you want to know why that brook dried up? Because Elijah had prayed that it might not rain. And that prayer not only affected Israel, that prayer affected Elijah. He made intercession against Israel, but he was caught up in that intercession as well. His book dried up also. Brethren, our nation's got to turn around. Our nation's got to come back. But we're going to get caught up in this. We are already caught up in this. We are praying for changes to be made, and we trust that those changes will be made. But before they're made, we all may see our brooks dry up. We all may pay more at the gas pump. We may all have to deal with the consequences of this type of thing. But if it comes out to where our nation turns, it'll be worth it in the end. And if our nation doesn't turn, there's nothing we can do to stop it anyway. It's just a matter of time. We need to be men like Elijah who will take a stand, who will stand up to kings. Ahab said to Elijah, you're the one troubling Israel. Now here's what Elijah said. Not I, but thou and thy house. How dare you call me the troublemaker? Elijah says, you're the reason for all of this. Have you ever wanted to tell somebody that? Have you ever wanted to point the finger at somebody and say, I'm not to blame for this, you are. This is because of your sins. This is because of your actions. You ever wanted to do that? Elijah wanted to do that, and he did it. He said, this is your fault. We need people who will do that. We need people who have the courage of Elijah to stand up and put the blame where the blame goes. In 
1 Kings 21, in verses 17 through 29, we read of the occasion where Jezebel has secured Naboth's vineyard for her husband. Now, Ahab wants it. And Ahab approaches Naboth and he wants to buy Naboth's vineyard. But that just shows how ignorant Ahab is. You could not buy someone's vineyard. It wasn't theirs to sell. It belonged to the family. It was to continue throughout that family through generations. It wasn't Naboth's to sell. But Ahab is so ignorant of how that God's economy is set up, he says, I want to buy it from you. Naboth explains, I couldn't sell it to you if I wanted to. So Ahab goes back and he tells Jezebel, he won't sell me his vineyard. Now, Jezebel didn't have to get Naboth to sell it. No, she'd just go take it. And here was Naboth, here was, here was Jezebel's way of taking it. We'll proclaim a fast. We'll, we'll make Naboth out to be this man of, that has blasphemed both God and the king. Then we'll have Naboth stoned. And by the way, we'll get rid of his sons as well because we don't want any claim on the property. And so we'll get rid of all of them and then it'll be yours, honey. And that's what she goes and she does. And since Naboth had not only blasphemed against God, but against the king, it becomes state property, which means it's Ahab's. Just as soon as Ahab hears that the property is his, he goes to visit his vineyard. And guess who he meets in his vineyard? Elijah. He's been hunting for Elijah everywhere and he can't find him. He goes to visit this vineyard that is not his, that he's stolen through murder. And there's Elijah. And Ahab says to Elijah, Hast thou found me, mine enemy? And you know what Elijah says? I have found you. You can't hide from God. Ahab couldn't hide from God. God knew exactly where Ahab was and when he was there, and he sent Elijah to meet him there. And Elijah begins to prophesy, and he tells Ahab, Ahab, you're going to be killed in battle. Ahab, this is what's going to happen to your family tree. Ahab, here's what's going to happen to your wife. The dogs are going to lick your blood, just like they've licked Naboth's blood. That's going to happen to you. Your wife's going to be eating the dogs. It begins just to lay out exactly what's going to happen. And on this one occasion, his message gets through. And Ahab is penitent. It's very interesting in the context. If you'll notice, in First Chronicles, or First Kings 21, Take a look at the context and look at verse 27. It says, It came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. Someone has said that Ahab put on his itchy pajamas. Well, that's what he did. He went on and he put, in sack, put on sackcloth and he went to bed. And he slept in sackcloth. You're not going to get any rest sleeping in sackcloth. But Ahab's finally sorry for something that he's done in his life. And because he's sorry, God is going to have mercy even on this wicked king. Because he's humbled himself, God said, I'm not going to bring this evil on him in his days. It's coming. It's not going to go away. But it's not going to happen in his days. He'll live out his days before the evil comes upon his family. That's the good God that we serve. But Elijah pronounced judgment on him. Go to 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. These are portions of the Bible we don't ever study. This is our one chance maybe to study them for a long time. So let's hit them very quickly. In 2 Kings chapter 1, we read about a, another king, Ahaziah. Ahaziah is the son-in-law of Ahab. He is a southern king. But he is a southern king um, who does not act like, live like uh, what he, he should. Ahaziah, as we, we talk about Ahaziah here in the context, he's fallen. He's fallen through the lattice work. He wants to know, am I going to get better? 
He doesn't send to Elijah to find out whether or not he's going to get better, but rather he sends to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Go over there and ask Beelzebub whether or not I'm going to recover. Now, Beelzebub, according to the Gentiles, was the god of life. The Jews called him the god of flies or the god of death. In the New Testament, he will be representative of Satan himself, Beelzebub. But here, he wants to send word over there. As these messengers are going to ask of, of Beelzebub whether or not he's going to live, they meet Elijah. And here's what Elijah says. Is there not a God in Israel? Is there not a God in Israel that he could ask about this? Does he really have to go over and ask Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, whether or not he's going to recover? You go back and tell him he's not going to come down. He's not going to get off of that bed that he's on. When they go back and they tell the king, no doubt they get back very quickly. The king wants to know, you haven't had time to go all the way over there to get this message. How is it? Well, we met someone, and he said, bring you this message. The king wants to know, Isaiah wants to know, what did he look like? What did he have on? And they begin to describe him. He said, it's Elijah. I just know it. I just know it's Elijah. He takes a captain, 50 men. He sends them to go get Elijah. The captain of the 50 men go to arrest Elijah. And they say to Elijah, come down. And Elijah says, No, but fire will come down, and fire comes down and devours them. The king sends another captain and fifty men. And this captain comes and he says, Come down quickly! Fire comes down again and devours them. The third captain and fifty come up to arrest Elijah, and this captain is far brighter than the other two. He doesn't come to Elijah and say, come down. He doesn't come to Elijah and say, come down quickly. He comes to Elijah and he says, come down, please. He falls on his knees before Elijah. Don't don't destroy me like you've destroyed the others. Please, come down. And Elijah is instructed to go down with him. Then Elijah delivers the same message to the king in person that he had delivered by these servants. Now, the point I want to get is this. You remember what Paul was accused of in the New Testament? They said he is... Mighty in letter, but he's weak in person. Paul, when he came, he wasn't weak in person. When Paul dealt with someone by letter, he dealt with them in the same way he would deal with them in person. That's true of Elijah as well. He didn't hold anything back. When he stood before the king, he delivered the message to him. The very first time that Elijah goes in and he talks to Ahab, you know what they talk about? They talk about the weather, right? First time you meet someone, very natural to talk about the weather, but this isn't an ordinary conversation. Uh, This is a conversation unlike any other conversation. There are tornado sirens going off in the background, if you will. He says, it's not going to rain again until I ask God to give it again. For 42 months, it doesn't rain. Three years and six months, they deal without. And it's all to bring about a change in Israel. Now, Baal was the Phoenician storm god. Sometimes Baal will be called the rain god. And he was that, but he was more than that. He was the storm god. And that involves lightning and thunder as well as rain. Now, the reason why that is important is because on Mount Carmel, when they are having this contest, the contest is to get God to send down fire. And Baal was the fire and rain god. He was the god of lightning as well as the god of rain. And so this was a fair contest. Bell was not at a disadvantage other than the fact that Bell didn't really exist. And that put him at a great disadvantage. But in their minds, he was at no disadvantage. Now when we think about Bell here, Bell was the storm god. And yet... For three and a half years, there had not been a drop of rain. There had not even been dew upon the earth. At some point, don't you think you could have figured out, I'm wasting my time talking to you, Belle, because you're not doing anything. You're not giving me anything. Every day that passed, Baal got weaker and weaker in the minds of the people. Their lives got harder and harder, and yet Baal did nothing to relieve their suffering. 
that was as it was intended to be. It was intended to bring them about to repentance. What if your football team went through this season and didn't win a game? What if your football team went through this season and didn't score a point? What if they went through next season? Didn't win a game, didn't score a point. What if they went through the next season? Didn't win a game, didn't score a point. What if they went through half of the next season and still had not done so? That's Team Bell. Team Bell has produced nothing for three and a half years. You remember a few years ago, the New Orleans Saints fan, and I can say this because they just won the Super Bowl fairly recently, a couple years ago, and so they're not as embarrassed as they used to be. Do you remember when they used to put bags on their heads and go to football games? Ah, that always struck me even as a kid. These football tickets aren't cheap. You're so protesting your team that you'll shell out the money for a ticket and go put a bag on your head to let everybody know how ashamed you are of your team. Well, that's commitment to a team in a strange kind of way. But you would think that the Bell followers would have been that way about their God as well because He's not doing anything. Think about this contest that is proposed in 1 Kings 18 between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Two, two oxen are chosen. They're allowed to go first. They choose which ox they want. They build their altar. They slay their ox. They put him on the, on the altar and they begin to cry out, O oh, Baal, hear us! O oh, Baal, hear us! And they do that from morning to noon, but there's not so much as a peep out of Baal. Not a response of any kind. They begin to jump on the altar. Still, no response. At noontime, Elijah begins to mock them. And he begins to say to them, cry a little louder. Maybe your God just can't hear you. Or maybe he's gone on a long journey. Or maybe he's out chasing somebody down. Or maybe he's asleep and you need to wake him up. And you know what the text tells us that they did in verse 28? They cried aloud. What they're doing is not working. We'll just do what Elijah tells us to do. We'll cry a little louder. Do you remember when you were in high school and one set of bleachers would challenge the other set of bleachers? We've got more spirit than you do. You get a little louder than the other one. That's what's going on here, but still no response. The text says that they began to cut themselves. The blood begins to spurt out. Still, there's no response. They do that until the time of the evening sacrifice. And at that point, Elijah steps up. Elijah builds his altar. And he does the strangest thing. He says, go get some water. Four buckets of water. Pours them on the altar. Go get four more buckets. Pours them on the altar. Go get four more buckets. Pours them on. And they cover the altar. They soak the wood. They soak the stones. They fill up the trench that's been prepared around the altar. And he calls out to God and fire comes down. And it devours the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licks up the water. Let me ask you, would it have been hard to determine who was God on top of that mountain? It would have been easy. And so it was. And so God's people are convinced of the truthfulness of what Elijah is doing. But he had the power to stand. And I want to make a point. I want you to get my point. You don't get anything else. I want you to get my point. When Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal, he commands the people, don't you let one of them get away. Don't let one of these 450 prophets get away. We think about Elijah against 450, but it wasn't that way at all. It was 450 to 2. Elijah wasn't up there by himself. He was up there with God. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one could stand against Elijah because God was with him. He wasn't up there by himself. These 450 prophets are defeated. He said, don't let them get away. Kill them. They are slain. Now the point is this. Elijah could have said, you know I've defeated them. I, I, have, I have made so clear that Baal is not a real God. That we, we can let these prophets go home. They have no danger. They are no threat anymore. Everybody's seen they can't do anything. 
That's not what Elijah did. Elijah said, here's my opportunity to get rid of 450 false teachers. The old law commands me to do that. That's what I'm going to do. And he had them put to death. Let me ask you, what kind of cancer doctor do you want? Do you want a cancer doctor who comes and says to you after surgery, I got rid of most of it. No. Do you want a cancer doctor that comes to you and says, you know, I knocked it down real good. I think it'll be some time before it gets back growing again. Or do you want a doctor that says, I got it all. I got it all. It's gone. You don't worry about it anymore. You, you're not going to be bothered by it anymore. It's done. When we get the opportunity to deal with sin, we ought to deal with it. And we ought to deal with it as thoroughly, as completely as we know how. Because if we don't, it has a tendency to come back again. In this context, there are 400 prophets that don't show up. I don't know why. If they had only shown up, then 850 could have died and it would have been over in Israel. But 400 remained. They're the prophets of Jezebel. They eat at her table. Maybe that's why they didn't show up. But they are going to stay around. But they're going to be the very ones that later will tell Ahab, Sure, Ahab, you go into battle. You're going to be victorious. Don't worry about it. Ahab wants to know, is there not anybody else out there who would give me a different opinion than them? Well, there's one man. His name's Micaiah. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't call him. I hate him. He never says anything good about me. I don't want Micaiah. The 400 prophets said, Ahab, you go up and you fight. So Ahab disguises himself. He goes up. He's not surrounded by the normal entourage. He's trying to cover himself in battle. And there's an archer that pulls back a bow at a venture. And that arrow finds Ahab in his chariot in disguise. And Ahab dies. That's exactly what Elijah said was going to happen. And that arrow found its way to Ahab that day. I want you to understand that if you stand in opposition to God, that arrow will one day find its way to you. And there's not a thing you can do to stop it. You can hide it. You can cover it up. You can do whatever you want to do. But that arrow is one day going to whistle through the air. And it's going to find you wherever you are. You can't avoid it if you're not willing to turn and repent of those sins. Let's finish up here. I wish I had so many more things I'd like to say, but 1 Kings 17, verses 8, beginning, we have Elijah who's being sent to the widow of Zarephath. She lives in the land of Sidon. That may not seem like that dangerous of a mission, but it's a very dangerous mission because Sidon is the land of Ethbel. It's the land where Jezebel's father reigns. It is the land where Jezebel was born. It is the center of Baal worship. God's looking for a place to hide Elijah. And He hides Elijah in Jezebel's hometown. And He hides him with a widow. Elijah had never been safer because Elijah was within the will of God. And you can't be safer than in God's will. And that's where he was. And God protects him there. Not only did Elijah stand with power, not only did Elijah preach with power, but Elijah also wrote with power. There's an interesting occasion in Second Chronicles 21 where we read of a letter that Elijah wrote. It is a short letter, but a powerful letter. Elijah was primarily a speaking prophet. He didn't do much writing. But here's something that he wrote. He had a message for a, pay, for a king. And this is the southern king that I was talking about. I think I referred to the one earlier. But this is the southern king I was talking about. And this southern king receives a message. He receives a message from Elijah. And evidently, this, le this letter was delivered after Elijah's death. And so it's a lightning bolt that came about after Elijah's gone. He being dead, yet spoke. And in this message, he says to Jehoram, the son-in-law they have. He says, you walked, you didn't walk in the ways of Jehoshaphat or Asa. Those were good kings. But rather, you walked like the kings of Israel. He says, you're a southern king, but you've lived like a northern king. 
You're a southern king, but you've committed the sins that were committed by the northern kings. Ahab was responsible for introducing Baal worship in Israel. Jehoram was responsible for introducing it to Judah. He corrupted Judah the same way that Ahab had corrupted Israel. And here's the message that's delivered him. There's a great plague going to fall on your family. There's great sickness that's coming your way. You're going to have a disease of the bowels. Your bowels are going to fall out as a result of your opposition to God. Most believe that this was a disease much like the disease that struck Herod in the New Testament. Probably some type of intestinal worms that literally devoured him from within. That's the punishment he received because of his opposition to God. Here's Elijah. He was a man of power. We need preachers like that. We need elders like that. We need deacons like that. We need members like that today. We need people that God can count on to speak the right thing, do the right thing, write the right thing. We need people to to take a stand. And Elijah was that man. Tonight, we invite you to respond to the invitation of our Lord. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent and turn away from every sin. Make the good confession. Be immersed in water for the remission of your sins then be faithful unto death. You need to obey the gospel. You need to come home. Do it as we stand, as we sing. Yeah.